cases. So guys, we're back with day four of the trial and everyone's been brought back into the court. So uh, if you remember yesterday, we had Detective Constable Stephen Duke who was on the stand and he's on the stand to assist the jury with the timeline of events for the prosecution. And he's appeared on the stand again today. Mr. Power says the stolen Mercedes was in an area that was general to the Lighthouse pub. And it was there for around three hours. Mr. Power says he'll play CCTV footage and it shows some of the movements of the vehicle. He also says this is assisted by maps and graphics to help the jury understand. A map of the area around the pub in Wallasey Village is also displayed for the, the court and the jury. DC Duke confirms that the Mercedes is parked up on Green Lane and this is time stamped at 20.57pm. After a few minutes it takes a left into Wallasey Village. This will be shown on CCTV footage again. The footage shows a car turning left into Wallasey Village. It drives towards the Premier Store shop. It parks up outside Fleur Ashley Tea Rooms. And it parks up on the side of the road. The car then turns around and goes back the way it came. And it parks up again on the left. Mr Power then moves on to a clip showing a woman, the same woman that can't be named, who was in the pub. And she arrives at the scene of the vehicle and this is time stamped at 11 minutes past 9pm. If you remember, she was a woman that had a, uh, multiple drinks poured over her head and she ended up storming out of the pub. The Mercedes drives along Wallasey Village. It goes past the lighthouse and it goes towards Liso Roundabout. There's other clips that shows cameras on St Mary's College. And there's also another one from Go Local Store that shows a Mercedes on the route towards the roundabout. There's also a clip from Sheridan's Bar, and this is in Wallasey Village. It shows a car having gone past Liso Roundabout. It travels further along Wallasey Village in the same direction. There's also a City Watch camera on the roundabout, and it shows a Mercedes then perform a U-turn, and it then travels back towards the roundabout. It passes the bar again, and DC Duke talks to the jury through its movements as, as the whole clip is played. Then you see the car turn left onto Liso Road, and then it turns back the way it came, and it travels along Liso Road back towards the roundabout. So basically there's a U-turn. It then turns left onto Wallasey Village, and it's now heading towards the Lighthouse pub. There's also CCTV footage from the Farmer's Arms pub, and it shows a car heading towards a lighthouse. There's also footage from an accountancy firm in Wallasey Village, and this shows a Mercedes passing the lighthouse pub. The Mercedes is then seen on Grove Road, and this is time stamped at 20 minutes past nine. This is around 25 minutes after its arrival in the same area. The Mercedes drives onto a car park of the lighthouse pub for the first time, and the jury can see this from the CCTV footage. Mr Power asks DC Duke to play further footage from the car park. Mr Power then points out a red van in the car park. He says to the jury, later in the evening, the Mercedes will park in a space next to it. But at this point, another white vehicle is occupying the space. The Mercedes then drives around the side of the lighthouse pub. It's shown facing the back of the pub. DC Duke confirms this is not the entrance where the shooting happened. Two minutes later, at 32 minutes past 9pm, CCTV footage shows Kieran Sulcold and Ellie Edwards leaving the Lighthouse pub. They both leave separately, and they both leave from the front entrance. Ellie was with her sister at this time, Lucy Edwards. The Mercedes then drives back around the side of the pub towards the entrance. The black Mercedes then drives around the side of the pub towards the back entrance. The car park is very busy at this time and the space next to the red van is still occupied. The black Mercedes then goes back to Wallasey Village and it parks on the side of the road directly in front of the pub's front facing the beer garden. The beer garden area is busy 
There's people smoking and there's people chatting. Mr Power says you can see in the near ground that the front of the pub is a popular place for smokers and vapours. DC Duke agrees and says yes. Mr Power says after 10pm a blue Volkswagen car belonging to a woman who can't be named and this is a different woman from the one from the lighthouse is shown arriving outside Chapman's home. Again this is at 165 Hewton Road. At 11 minutes past 10 the car then leaves. Now the Mercedes is back in Wallasey Village and it moves from the space where it parked up outside the lighthouse pub. DC Duke said it just moves a short distance to the next block. Mr Power says then it does a U-turn in the United Reformed Church car park and then parks outside Clintology so it has a view of the lighthouse pub. So Mr Power says at 17 minutes past 10pm, the person that has been driving the Mercedes, obviously they claim that's Connor Chapman, he gets out of the car and walks towards the church. He's not seen on footage for approximately 13 minutes after that. Mr Power then asks for an aerial photograph of the area to be displayed. This photograph shows an alleyway behind the church. It leads towards the rear of the lighthouse pub. That figure is then seen walking back towards the Mercedes. At half past 10pm, Mr Power says when the figures returned to their car, there was a call between Lauren Morris and Thomas Waring. This driver of the car is then seen on foot and it walks past the car entrance. Mr Power says the person they allege that is Connor Chapman walks past the car and then turns around. At the very same time, Kieran Selkeld is in the car park, but he's got his back to the suspect. Mr Power says at the time that the man in the car was there, that's pretty much the same view the Mercedes is going to have later on when it's in the bay of the car park. DC Duke says it's pretty much the same view. Further footage shows the suspect ducking and he ducks behind a wall and it's just outside the pub car park. Mr Power says at 36 minutes past 10pm and this is around an hour and a half since the car first arrived. The figure then walks past and appears to see that the bay next to the red van in the car park of the front of the pub is now empty. At 6 minutes to 11pm, the figure alleged to be Chapman walks back towards the United Reformed Church. Again, he's not seen on camera for another two minutes. At 3 minutes to 11pm, the Mercedes is seen driving off. So just to recap, the suspect is on foot between 17 minutes past 10 up until 3 minutes to 11. And this is for around 40 minutes. DC Duke talks the jury through a CCTV clip that shows the Mercedes travelling towards the car park. It pulls into the free bay right next to the red van. He parks at a very odd angle if you look at the way he's parked, says DC Duke. And the clip shows the car reversing into the bay. And it reverses diagonally into the bay. DC Duke says, I would like you to know that when we see the driver's hands turning the wheel, we can very distinctively see red gloves. Mr Power says, a driver who can be seen wearing red gloves climbs into the rear seat after the lights turn off. DC Duke talks the jury through some still images showing the driver's red gloves on the steering wheel. He now talks the jury through the clip showing the driver climbing into the rear seat of the Mercedes. Mr Power says the car parked up at 2 minutes to 11pm. It remained there until 49 minutes past 11. It was there for around 51 minutes. Mr Power asked DC Duke to display a graphical representation of the overall movements of the car. This is to help the jury. There is a small delay due to a few technical issues, but that's resolved quite quick. Mr Power moves on and shows at 11 minutes past 11pm 
The taxi booking was made under a false name, Joe Stinney. And this is between Big Meadow Road and Upton Road. But he's there, so I'll look at that later on. Mr Power says, at 43 minutes past 11pm, we are really coming towards the time of the shooting. The jury has shown stills of CCTV from inside the lighthouse, and this shows Kieran Selkeld and Ellie Edwards heading towards the front entrance. This is then followed by Harry Logan, Nicholas Speed and Leon Carr. A few moments go by and Jake Duffy also leaves a pub. Mr Power says the jury will now see a clip of CCTV footage showing the gunman in the car park. The footage shows the gunman get out and he ducks between the cars. He stands by that red van. He's keeping low at this point so he can't be seen and he's there for a few minutes. He then crosses over to the building line of the pub and heads towards the front entrance. Another clip showing four of the victims standing outside the pub is played to the jury. Both Ellie Edwards and Kieran Selkeld are also visible in this footage. At 51 minutes past 11pm, the footage from the other angle shows a gunman walking along the building line. He's seen looking at a woman called Jamie Stanton. Then the person steps out from the side of the building and fires a gun with both hands, while at the same time moving backwards towards the car. Next, the jury see a crime scene photo which shows the area where Ellie Edwards was shot. Mr. Power asked DCD to show an enhanced still image of the CCTV which shows the gunman. In this image, the red gloves are visible. You can also see white flashing on his trainers. The gunman is wearing grey tracksuit bottoms and a darker coloured top. He's also wearing a balaclava style thing covering his face. The jury have played a full clip, but both angles are shown at the same time. As the gunman fires, Ellie and Selkeld drop to the floor instantly. Selkeld is lying on his back at this time, and like I said before, he freezes for a second, and then he starts propping himself up, and he gets himself up by going onto his hands. He appears to reach towards his back. Ellie, who landed with her arms across Selkeld, is lying motionless. The gunman jumps back inside the Mercedes. He pulls out of the bay and turns on to Wallasey Village. There's more footage inside the pub shows Liam Carr and Jake Duffy rush back inside. Mr Power says, at 52 minutes past 11pm, Jamie Stanton made a 999 call. The jury are then shown a transcript of the call. Mr Power says, when Jamie Stanton made this call, she was very upset. About 18 minutes later, a police officer arrived wearing body cam equipment and recorded an account from her, and that's also been transcribed. The call is around 11 minutes and 9 seconds long, and Mr Power reads from the transcript. The operator says, Merseyside Police. Jamie says, Hi, oh my God, followed by her crying. The operator says, What's happened? And Jamie says, Someone has been shot, oh my god. And the operator says, Somebody's been shot? And Jamie says, yes. The operator says, where are you? Where are you? Jamie says, I'm sorry, I'm trying to be calm. I'm in the lighthouse in Wallasey. The operator says, just breathe, just breathe for me. Jamie says, I'm really sorry. There's at least two people who've been shot. Oh my god. Miss Stanton says the offender has driven off. She said I saw him with the gun. He had a black balaclava on. There was a thing on the end of the gun. It almost looked like a propeller. I saw him. I was going to warn the boy. I was going to shoot round to them, but I couldn't. She says the car was black. She says she does not know the people who have been shot. Miss Stanton says there are at least a 100 people in the pub, but she thinks two of them have been shot. She says to the operator, one is inside and one is outside. Miss Stanton is heard crying throughout the call. The operator says to her, all right, just calm down, all right. We're going to help them. Jamie says, I'm really trying. The operator says, police and ambulance are on the way. Jamie says, a girl, I think someone's dead. 
I think she might be dead. And she starts crying hysterically. I can only see two people. Someone is doing CPR. Should I see if there is a defibrillator? The operator says they cannot give medical advice. And they ask, do you know what the injuries are? Jamie says, sorry, I'm trying to look. Back of the head, back of the head. The girl's been shot in the back of the head and the boy. I can't see where he's been shot. The operator says, did you see the offender? Jamie says, I think the girl might be dead. The operator asks again if she saw the offender and if it was one. Jamie says, yeah, he had a balaclava on. I'm sorry, I saw him, I didn't tell them. Oh my God, I watched him. I watched him shoot her. The operator says, you're doing your best, okay? You're doing the right thing. You've done your best. And Jamie says, please, there's still no one here. And the operator reassures her they are on their way. Jamie says, they've definitely drove off in the black Mercedes. I saw him. I think they might have gone left towards the farmer's arm pub. The operator asks her, do you know the people who's been injured? And Jamie says, I don't know either of them. There is someone still doing CPR on the girl, but I think she might be dead. She says she thinks the boy is moving. At this time, the police then arrive on the scene and the paramedics arrive. The operator asks her to flag them down. Mr Stanton says she does not know if anyone else has been shot. And at this point, the call ends. Mr Power then shows a CCTV still image of Selko being taken back into the pub. Next, they see a plan showing where bullet castings and fragments were found in the car park. He says he'll now deal with body cam footage of Jamie Stanton. He says PC Matthew Titley recorded the conversation with Miss Stanton. But Mr Power suggests that it might be a good time to have a break, so they have a 15 minute break. So when everyone's brought back into court, Mr Power rises and he says they will hear a statement from PC Matthew Titley. He recorded the conversation with Jamie Stanton. As he reads the statement, he says, I was on duty in uniform mobile patrol in company with Constable Dunn. We were deployed to an emergency graded call to Lighthouse in Wallasey Village in relation to a shooting where we were informed people had been shot outside and there was blood everywhere. PC Titley says he arrived shortly after midnight and he also activated his body cam. He said a lot of people were present crying and screaming. He also says he approached a female on the ground covered in blood, but she was being treated. A female approached me in hysterics, he says. She could barely speak. She said she had seen the entire incident. He said this woman was Jamie Stanton, and he sat her down and he got her a drink of water. Mr Power says he will read for the first page of the transcript of the conversation and then play the footage. He says Miss Stanton was in a deep state of distress and she was sobbing hysterically. Jamie Stanton says, I watched everything happen, what vehicle they're in. PC Titley reassures Miss Stanton and takes her inside. She didn't want to go, so they made their way to a quiet area. PC Titley gets Miss Stanton a glass of water. And this footage is then shown to the jury. It shows Miss Stanton, with long brown hair, carrying a glass of water, sobbing as she explains what happened. I was trying to find my taxi. I turned around and there was a boy with brown hair. He stood there with a gun. I didn't think it was a gun. It had like a propeller on the end, like a fan. It looked like the fan. She says she saw the man looking at people in the front of the pub. The man was wearing a balaclava, hat and black buffer jacket. I was going to tell them, but he saw me. He looked right at me. At this point, Miss Stanton is extremely upset, and she's struggling to breathe on the footage. She drinks the water, and she explains where she stood in relation to the area where Ellie Edwards was shot. Miss Stanton was quoted as saying, I looked over this way, on the corner of the building. There was a boy, and he had brown hair, for definite, and it was sticking out on top. Miss Stanton then gets overwhelmed as she starts hyperventilating and she sits down. 
PC Titley's radio can be heard in the background, and she's sobbing. PC Titley says, so you saw one male, yeah? And Jamie says, yeah. He also asks, what was he wearing? Jamie says, a black puffer coat, a balaclava. He had, like, brown hair up to his eyes. He had his hood pulled up. She says he had gloves on. PC Titley asks her what he was holding. He was like this thing on the end, she says. He had his hands on it. He was hiding around the corner. I just thought he was going to throw a bottle. I knew he was going to do something, but I didn't know it was a gun. At this point, she gets really upset, but she regains her composure. She says the gun had a thing on the end. She said, it really threw me off. Again, this upsets her and she's got to regain herself again. PC Titley then says, you didn't realise it was a gun, did you? And she says, no, it was so strange. He looked round the corner. It was targeted. In my opinion, it was targeted. He looked round the corner to see who was there. He looked me dead in the eye. I wanted to say to the people, watch out, but I couldn't because he would have shot me. He turned back round. It was that quick. And then it was like bang, 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 bang. She says everyone was screaming. I just saw those people fall to the floor. At this point, Mr Power stops the recording and he continues reading through the transcript. He says, Jamie Stanton said, everyone was screaming, get inside, get inside. Mr Titley says, did you see the car? Jamie Stanton says, no, at the end, at the end. Another woman then approaches PC Titley and says, I did CPR on the girl. Miss Stanton says she does not know the gunman and he had a balaclava on. She also says, I hid as fast as I could. I looked up, then a black Mercedes, one like everyone has, an A-class maybe. It had to be them as it came out so fast. I just couldn't understand why anyone would do that. The thing is, even if he was shooting at the boy, he shot the girl as well. Someone said she's dead. She says she saw white powder coming from the gun. She said he wasn't very tall and he was about her height with normal build. PC Titley says he will not take a formal statement now and she'll be called on a later date. He says to her, you're in far too much distress to talk about it now. He says to a colleague, we need to try and get her home, Sarge. Jamie Stanton says, poor family and friends. And that concludes that transcript. So Katie Appleton, the junior counsel for the prosecution, is now going to read some witness statements. Harry Logan is the first statement to be read out. He was one of the males wounded in the attack. He says he went to the pub with his friends, which was full of people we knew. During the night, we were talking to lots of different people we knew. All of a sudden, I saw someone walk around the corner. They were wearing a full face covering. I could only see their eyes. They raised a gun and pointed it in the direction I was stood. I heard a loud bang and was spun around by the force of it hitting my forearm. He says he ran inside but fainted when he saw the blood on his arm. The pub was in some sort of mad panic. And people were running everywhere, he says. He says he did not realise anyone else was injured until he was taken to hospital. He said he was travelling with a man he later found out was Jake Duffy. He says he believed he was going to die. I am totally shocked by what I saw today. Who walks into a pub on Christmas Eve and does that? It's just fucked up. And that concludes Harry's statement. The next statement is Nicholas Speed. Mr Speed says he arrived at the pub with three friends. They arrived between 6pm and 7pm. He said the pub was busy and it took around 15 minutes to get served. His girlfriend and his sister were also there. He says at one point a woman called Katie Jones had an argument with another girl about an ex-boyfriend. At this point, the bar stopped serving drinks for a while until the woman left and the pub was less busy for a while. He said he went outside with a woman he knew called Ashley. 
He said there was other people outside to the right close to the steps. I was talking to Ashley and having a cigarette. Shots were fired and I didn't see the gunman but I heard people screaming after the shots and people running inside the pub. At that point I felt a pinch in my calf. I then saw a female on the floor close to the steps. I saw blood on the floor and I ran into the pub. When I came back into the pub I saw that a male who I did not know and a female had been shot. He said someone argued with him for mentioning that his calf was hurting because a female had been shot. He said he saw a hole in his jeans and saw a mark on his calf. He described it like something worse than a paintball, like something was hot. He said he did not require a medical attention for his injury, but it resulted in a bruise to his calf. Mr. Speed said he was found walking around and he, he was quoted as saying, I usually try not to think about it anymore as it is hard to think about. And that concludes his statement. Now Mr. Powers goes on about more calls that were made. He says David McKellen, Connor Chapman's granddad, called Chapman for three minutes on New Year's Day while in the presence of Sergeant Alan O'Shugnessy. Sergeant O'Shugnessy is called to give evidence and he's sworn in by the court usher. He confirms his details and confirms he was dispatched to an address with other officers in Woodland Road, Woodchurch. They were there to execute a warrant under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, known as PACE. He confirms that is the address of Connor Chapman's grandparents. Sergeant Allen says firearms officers attended initially and confirmed he was at the property. He says he realised Chapman was not there. They went into the property while activating his body-worn camera. He served a copy of the warrant to David McKellen. He introduced himself as Connor Chapman's grandfather. Mr Power asked him to confirm that Glennis McKillen, Chapman's grandmother, said she had COPD and was reluctant to leave the property. Sergeant Allen says, it was quite clear to me at the time she was in no condition to leave the property at the time overnight. I didn't go into too much detail. I explained that we were there on behalf of the investigation team and it was also a serious offence and we needed to speak to Connor. He says Mr McKellen was very helpful and he used his phone to call Connor Chapman. It was noted that he saved Connor Chapman's number under the name Con. He says he explained to Connor that a police officer wanted to speak to him. Then he handed the phone to me to speak to Connor. I didn't go into too much detail. I explained to Connor I was at his grandparents' address and I was there to execute a search warrant and that Merseyside Police needed to speak to him in regards to a serious matter. I explained that Connor was to be arrested and taken to a police station and would be interviewed. And I asked him where he was. I explained to Connor at the request of the investigation team his grandparents were requested to be located to another property. I explained I was aware of his grandparents' medical condition and that as soon as Connor made himself available, the sooner we could leave his grandparents. Connor stated he was in Liverpool with his girlfriend. I explained the need for us to arrest and interview him. I explained I could get someone to come and arrest him and take him to the nearest police station and he refused to do so. Sergeant Allen said Chapman indicated he would get a lift back to his grandparents' address. He said he waited for a period of time and said the initial decision was that the grandparents would need to be located to another property. However, he spoke to investigators and he explained that Glynis was not in the condition to be moved. Mr Power then asked him if he asked Mr McKellen to contact Connor Chapman again. Sergeant Allen said Mr McKellen agreed to call his grandson. This time it went straight to the answering machine. His granddad also sent a text to Chapman and the text message said please ring me back but Chapman did not do so. Mr Power says he's got no further questions for Sergeant Allen. Mark Ryan KC who's defending Connor Chapman says he has a few short questions for Sergeant Allen. He asked Sergeant Allen to confirm 
He did not take a note of the conversation until nine days later. Sergeant Allen said, because it is not his team conducting the search, he did not complete a search record and the search team would have been unaware of the conversation. Sergeant Allen says, For that I apologise. I should have made a note of that at the time, says Sergeant Allen. Mr Ryan says he is not suggesting he has done anything wrong. Mr Ryan asks if he implied that Chapman came back he would not search their home. The sergeant says no, and the search would always have taken place. Mr Ryan says, Connor Chapman agrees that you said to him you need to speak to him about a serious investigation. He agrees you spoke to him about issues with his grandparents and his nan's illness. He agrees he said he was in Liverpool. And he agrees there was a discussion of ways for him to come back. He suggests you may not have said he would have been arrested. We were trying to make it attractive for him to come back and you never said he would have been arrested. Sergeant Allen says, I totally disagree with that. Mr Ryan says, Sergeant Allen may have used white lies to get him to come back. The officer disagreed. He said he told Chapman what would happen, but that completes his evidence. And there's no further questions. Before we continue with the trial, don't forget to like and subscribe. So the next witness to be called by Mr Powers is PC Sean Gates. He's from the Welsh Police Force. PC Gates steps up to the witness box. He confirms he is based in Newtown. Mr Powers says Chapman was arrested in Newtown on January the 10th. PC Gates confirms Chapman was taken to the police station in handcuffs. Mr Powers asks him, were you tasked with remaining with Mr Chapman to observe him at a level that meant you were standing in the cell doorway in a way that meant he was unable to harm himself or make any attempt to destroy evidence? PC Gate says that is correct. He also says he made a note of what happened. He was observing Chapman and he has a copy of the notes with him. He said he took this observation at 32 minutes past 6 p.m. You can sit in the cell door with him. You can engage in general conversation. The detained person requested to have something to eat. While we made that, he made a comment saying he was gutted because he was going to hand himself in on Monday because he didn't want to be arrested. He said he was not fussed about being here in the custody suit for murder, but more about newspaper articles naming and shaming him as he had done to others. At 36 minutes past 7pm, Connor Chapman said, Gun crime is at an all-time high and some people are ruthless. There is a time and a place for that shit. He also said he saw a clip of the gunshots on the news and it sounded like an automatic fire in 13 shots, not 6 or 7 like the newspapers were saying. PC Gates said Chapman also made a comment. This suggested he didn't care about being arrested for murder. Chapman supposedly said, they didn't have anything on me. Mr Power says he has no further questions. So it's now Mr Ryan's turn. Remember Mr Ryan is defending Connor Chapman. Mr Ryan suggests that there are other interactions that were not recorded in this set of notes in the five hours he was observing him. Mr Ryan says, you have a lot more conversations with Connor Chapman than the bits you have told us about. PC Gates says, yes. He said, there's lots of general conversation. And he also says that the bits that he has recorded were seen by him as a little bit important. Mr Ryan points out that Chapman also discussed his past. He also said how he was a changed person now. Mr Ryan also asks if Chapman gave the impression that other people had been arrested and named and shamed over the shooting. PC Gates agrees. Mr Ryan says, there are remarks as part of a long general conversation. PC Gates says, I didn't ask him any questions about the offence, but yes. Mr Ryan suggests that Connor Chapman's comment about gun crime was saying that 
If you're going to do this kind of thing, you don't do it on Christmas Eve in a busy pub. PC Gates says he did not know what Chapman meant by his comment. He confirms he made notes in the cell doorway. Mr Ryan says at 8pm Chapman asked when he had been taken to Merseyside and at 8.07pm he said he felt like he was having a panic attack. Four minutes later he said he doesn't care about the murder, they don't have anything on me. PC Gates says he was talking to himself in the cell after he calmed down. Mr Ryan says there was a discussion about food and drink. He also said it was about calling a solicitor and his interests. Again, he says there's lots of general conversation over the five hours. PC Gates agrees and says yes. Mr Ryan has no further questions for PC Gates and PC Gates leaves the stand. Now Miss Appleton stands. Remember, she's a junior counsel for the prosecution. She's there to deal with some agreed facts regarding the crime scene investigation at the Lighthouse pub. She says, crime scene investigator Lindsay Breverton attended the pub and recovered items including a cartridge case. These were recovered from the front tyre of a vehicle. There is corresponding pictures that the jury are shown. The jury are shown pictures of 9mm cartridge cases. These include ones recovered from the floor. They were recovered under a vehicle in the car park. There was another that was recovered within a disabled bay in the car park. And also there was another from under a different vehicle. There were a few more cases which were also recovered. And this was within the car park. Miss Appleton says, Damaged 9mm short jacket, .38 calibre bullets were recovered. Other items include bullet fragments and these were found in a beer garden in the front of the double doors of the pub. Miss Appleton says another crime scene investigator, Carl Cannon, also attended and recovered further bullet fragments from around the pub. Another crime scene investigator, Sarah Ferris, recovered a bullet from the skirting board in the front entrance hallway of the pub. Now Mr Power stands. He asked the court usher to recall Detective Constable Stephen Duke. So again, DC Duke resumes his position in the witness box. So again, DC Duke stands in the witness box. The jury has shown a slide which refers to the gunman's movements. This is between 2057 and 2352 pm. This was on the night of the shootings. The jury has shown an interactive map. This displays the locations of the black Mercedes used by the gunman. It shows it stopped in Wallasey Village before the shooting. Mr Power said, as we heard earlier, the offender left the vehicle and walked back and forth in front of the lighthouse pub. He then goes back into the car. The gunman was on foot for about 30 minutes. The Mercedes then parks up in a position. It remained there until after the shooting. After the gunman opened fire, he drives off in the Mercedes. He heads off towards Liso Roundabout. Mr Power says they will now move on to movements of the car after it left the car park after the shooting. They can see that the car moves from the left of the pub, goes along Wallace Village, and it heads towards Liso Roundabout. The jury has shown the CCTV footage of this journey. Mr Power says, unsurprisingly, going at quite a lick now. DC Duke replies, the car then takes a right onto Liso Road. There's more footage which is shown of the car travelling at speed along Liso Road towards the slip road. DC Duke says the next turning will be onto the left of the A554 slip road towards the motorway. A City Watch camera recorded that footage and it, sh and it showed the car going around a slip road roundabout before taking a right onto Junction 4 of the motorway. It headed southbound. Mr Power says the next recording is of the vehicle in private drive in Barnston. Thomas Waring's home address is close to the junction with Storton Lane, although the junction itself is not covered by CCTV cameras. 
Another house further up Privet Drive did have CCTV cameras, which shows the Mercedes on Private Drive. Another camera shows it turning left onto Overdale Avenue. Supposedly the driver, alleged to be Chapman, is then seen walking from Overdale Avenue and they go back onto Private Drive. More footage is played to the jury. It shows a suspect walking along Private Drive towards Stoughton Lane. The suspect appears to drop something on the ground. He bends down and he retrieves it, but then he carries on walking away. Mr Power says, you know the prosecution say that is Connor Chapman and that is a gun that drops out. He says that's not him. Mr Power then shows an enhanced still image of the moment the suspect drops the item and this is shown to the jury. DC Duke says the suspect is walking along private drive. He appears to look towards the CCTV camera. Katie Appleton will now read a few statements. The next statement is from Lauren Morris. The statement refers to movements of Thomas Waring. She says she has known him for around 12 months. She said she's been seeing him for three months. She says he is not her boyfriend, but she has been seeing him. On December the 24th, Tom called him and told her he was in Manchester and asked her what her plans were later, she said. At half past ten, she received a call from Waring. He arranged to come to visit her. He arrived in a taxi and this was around 11pm. When Thomas Waring left, he ordered a taxi from an app on his phone. But he wanted to go to a man's house that can't be named for legal reasons. He says he receives messages from Thomas Waring on Instagram while he was at a friend's drinking at around 10pm. Thomas Waring picked up the man and another friend in a taxi and went to the man's house. They drank a bit and smoked some weed. The unnamed man was quoted as saying, He said one of either Waring or the other man showed them of a video of the aftermath of the shooting showing a girl on the floor. He said other men arrived at his house, but the witness said he could not remember what time. He says Waring left his home at around 1am on Christmas Day. He said he received a call from his dad. He said he was unsure of how Thomas Waring left, but assumed it would have been in a taxi. He confirms he has known Thomas Waring for around 10 years. And that concludes his statement. Mr Power rises and points the jury to a timeline showing the call of Waring's phone to a taxi service. This was booked under the name Joe Stinney. Miss Apton reads the statement of the taxi driver. His name is Hashim Abusif. The driver says he took a fare booking from an online app to take a customer to Upton from Big Meadow Road. But he could not recall anything significant about the journey. Now Mr Power returns to the timeline. He says that Waring spoke to his father, John Waring, on the phone at around 12.30am. He says there was no taxi bookings made and then cancelled under the name Joe Stinney. There is a further call between Waring and his dad and then a further booking is made. At 35 minutes past 12am, Ellie Edwards was pronounced dead. At around 12.40am, there was a call from Argyle Taxis to Warren's phone, which appeared to be a notification of pickup. Now Katie Appleton reads the statements of the taxi driver. He confirms he took a customer from Upton to Private Drive. He said it was about 10 to 15 minutes journey. He also said there was no conversation. He said there was no conversation and he didn't hear the man make any calls. And that concludes the taxi driver's statement. Now Mr Power shows CCTV footage of Private Drive, and this is timestamp shortly before 4am. It shows a pedestrian who the prosecution say is Connor Chapman. They're seen walking along towards Overton Avenue, where the Mercedes is parked before running along a short distance and slowing down. 
He was off camera on Overdale Avenue for around 9 minutes and 11 seconds. The Mercedes then reverses out of Overdale. It continues up Private Drive. It goes at quite a slow speed to Waring's home. Another booking was made by Waring's phone for Private Drive without a house number. This was to Ford Way in Woodchurch. Again, they didn't provide a number and it was under a false name, Ben Williams. Now, Mr Power will play an audio call for the booking. You can hear that the driver says, you haven't put a house number on your booking. The phone user says, it's just the first one as you turn in. And this is alleged to be Thomas Waring. The taxi driver says he will be around 10 minutes. And that's the end of the audio call. Now Miss Appleton reads the statement of Richard Bolton, the driver who took the fare and spoke on the phone. He says he is self-employed, but also takes jobs from Argyle Taxis. When accepting jobs from Argyle, he says customers are able to make bookings over the phone or on an app. He said he was on duty when a job came onto the system in the early hours of Christmas morning, and this was a pick-up from Private Drive. He says there was no house number, so he used the number on the system to ring the passenger. The passenger said they'd be waiting on the corner. Mr Bolton picked up a mail on Private Drive. The mail asked to be taken to Ford Way. He says he put the area of Woodchurch into the system. He also says he pulled up on Ford Way. Then the mail paid with a £20 note. The taxi driver said, I generally always talk to passengers, usually about the weather or general trap. I tried to talk to the passenger, but he was quiet and didn't engage. He was slouched back in the seat. He described the passenger as having dark tatty and messy hair. He also said it was a small to medium build. So that concludes Mr Bolton's statement. Now Mr Power shows a CCTV clip of the taxi driver along Hewton Road, heading towards Ford Way. Mr Power asked DC Duke to show a clip from a camera facing Chapman's home on Hewton Road. The taxi can be seen stopping in a distance on Ford Way. More footage shows the figure the prosecution alleged to be Connor Chapman running past the front of his home on 165 Hewton Road. Another camera further along Hewton Road captures the figure jogging past. More footage shows the rear of the properties on Hewton Road. This captures the figures walking past. Then the figure jogs back to the same direction. The figure then reappears at the front of Hewton Road and heads towards 165 Hewton Road. Mr Power says, at 10 to 1pm on Christmas Day, another call is made to book a taxi from Waring's phone number under the name Ben Williams, and they pick him up from Private Drive. The taxi made a drop-off at the Horse and Jockey pub. At this point, the court breaks for the day. And if anyone's got this far again, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe.